Philanthropy, Wikipedia article audio. Philanthropy means the love of humanity. A conventional modern definition is private initiatives, for the public good, focusing on quality of life, which combines an original humanistic tradition with a social scientific aspect developed in the 20th century. The definition also serves to contrast philanthropy with business endeavors, which are private initiatives for private good, e.g., focusing on material gain, and with government endeavors, which are public initiatives for public good, e.g., focusing on provision of public services. A person who practices philanthropy is called a philanthropist. Etymology Philanthropy has distinguishing characteristics separate from charity, not all charity is philanthropy, or vice versa though there is a recognized degree of overlap in practice. A difference commonly cited is that charity aims to relieve the pain of a particular social problem, whereas philanthropy attempts to address the root cause of the problem the difference between the proverbial gift of a fish to a hungry person, versus teaching them how to fish. In the 2nd century CE, Plutarch used the Greek concept of philanthropia to describe superior human beings. During the Roman Catholic Middle Ages, philanthropia was superseded by caritas charity, selfless love, valued for salvation and escape from purgatory. Philanthropy was modernized by Sir Francis Bacon in the 1600s who is largely credited with preventing the word from being owned by horticulture. Bacon considered philanthropia to be synonymous with goodness, which correlated with the Aristotelian conception of virtue, as consciously instilled habits of good behavior. Samuel Johnson simply defined philanthropy as love of mankind, good nature. This definition still survives today and is often cited more gender-neutrally as the love of humanity. Europe By 1920, the Rockefeller Foundation was opening offices in Europe. It launched medical and scientific projects in Britain, France, Germany, Spain, and elsewhere. It supported the health projects of the League of Nations. Great Britain in London prior to the 18th century, parochial and civic charities were typically established by bequests and operated by local church parishes or guilds. During the 18th century, however, a more activist and explicitly Protestant tradition of direct charitable engagement during life took hold, exemplified by the creation of the Society for the Promotion of Christian Knowledge and Societies for the Reformation of Manners. 19th Century In 1739, Thomas Coram, appalled by the number of abandoned children living on the streets of London, received a royal charter to establish the Foundling Hospital to look after these unwanted orphans in Lamb's Conduit Fields, Bloomsbury. This was the first children's charity in the country, and one that set the pattern for incorporated associational charities in general. The hospital marked the first great milestone in the creation of these new style charities. Red Cross Jonas Hanway, another notable philanthropist of the era, established the Marine Society in 1756 as the first seafarer's charity, in a bid to aid the recruitment of men to the Navy. By 1763, the Society had recruited over 10,000 men and it was incorporated in 1772. Hanway was also instrumental in establishing the Magdalen Hospital to rehabilitate prostitutes. These organizations were funded by subscription and run as voluntary associations. 
They raised public awareness of their activities through the emerging popular press and were generally held in high social regard. Some charities received state recognition in the form of the Royal Charter. France Philanthropists, such as anti slavery campaigner William Wilberforce, began to adopt active campaigning roles, where they would champion a cause and lobby the government for legislative change. This included organized campaigns against the ill treatment of animals and children and the campaign that succeeded in ending the slave trade throughout the empire starting in 1807. Although there were no slaves allowed in Britain itself, many rich men owned sugar plantations in the West Indies, and resisted the movement to buy them out until it finally succeeded in 1833. Financial donations to organized charities became fashionable among the middle class in the 19th century. By 1869 there were over 200 London charities with an annual income, altogether, of about £2 million. By 1885, rapid growth had produced over 1,000 London charities with an income of about £4.5 million. They included a wide range of religious and secular goals, with the American import, the YMCA. Germany War and post-war, Belgium and Eastern Europe United States Andrew Carnegie Led by the energetic Lord Shaftesbury, philanthropists organized themselves. In 1869 they set up the Charity Organization Society. It was a federation of district committees, one in each of the 42 poor law divisions. Its central office had experts in coordination and guidance, thereby maximizing the impact of charitable giving to the poor. Many of the charities were designed to alleviate the harsh living conditions in the slums. Such as the Laborers' Friends Society founded in 1830. This included the promotion of allotment of land to laborers for cottage husbandry that later became the allotment movement, and in 1844 it became the first model dwellings company and organization that sought to improve the housing conditions of the working classes by building new homes for them, while at the same time receiving a competitive rate of return on any investment. This was one of the first housing associations, a philanthropic endeavor that flourished in the second half of the 19th century brought about by the growth of the middle class. Later associations included the Peabody Trust, and the Guinness Trust. The principle of philanthropic intention with capitalist return was given the label 5% philanthropy. In 1863, the Swiss businessman Henry Dunat used his personal fortune to fund the Geneva Society for Public Welfare which became the International Committee of the Red Cross. During the Franco-Prussian War of 1870, Dunat personally led Red Cross delegations that treated soldiers. He shared the first Nobel Peace Prize for this work in 1901. The French Red Cross played a minor role in the war with Germany. After that it became a major factor in shaping French civil society as a non-religious humanitarian organization. It was closely tied to the Army's service de Santa. By 1914 it operated 1,000 local committees with 164,000 members, 21,500 trained nurses, and over 27 million francs in assets. The International Committee of the Red Cross played a major role in working with POWs on all sides in World War II. It was in a cash-starved position when the war began in 1939, but quickly mobilized its national offices set up a central prisoner of war agency. For example, 
it provided food, mail, and assistance to 365,000 British and Commonwealth soldiers and civilians held captive. Suspicions, especially by London, of ICRC as too tolerant or even complicit with Nazi Germany led to its sidelining in favor of the UN Relief and Rehabilitation Administration as the primary humanitarian agency after 1945. In France, the Pasteur Institute had a monopoly of specialized microbiological knowledge allowed it to raise money for serum production from both private and public sources walking the line between a commercial pharmaceutical venture and a philanthropic enterprise. By 1933, at the depth of the Great Depression, the French wanted a welfare state to relieve distress, but did not want new taxes. War veterans came up with a solution, the new national lottery proved highly popular to gamblers, while generating the cash needed without raising taxes. American money proved invaluable. The Rockefeller Foundation opened an office in Paris and helped design and fund France's modern public health system, under the National Institute of Hygiene. It also set up schools to train physicians and nurses. The history of modern philanthropy The European continent is especially important in the case of Germany, which became a model for others especially regarding the welfare state. The princes and in the various imperial states continued traditional efforts, such as monumental buildings, parks and art collections. Starting in the early 19th century, the rapidly emerging middle classes made local philanthropy a major endeavor to establish their legitimate role in shaping society, in contradistinction to the aristocracy and the military. They concentrated on support for social welfare institutions, higher education and cultural institutions, as well as some efforts to alleviate the hardships of rapid industrialization. The bourgeoisie was defeated in its effort to it gain political control in 1848, but they still had enough money and organizational skill that could be employed through philanthropic agencies to provide an alternative power base for their world view. Religion was a divisive element in Germany, as the Protestants, Catholics and Jews used alternative philanthropic strategies. The Catholics, for example, continued their medieval practice of using financial donations in their wills to lighten their punishment in purgatory after death. The Protestants did not believe in purgatory, but made a strong commitment to the improvement of their communities here and now. Conservative Protestants raised concerns about deviant sexuality, alcoholism and socialism, as well as illegitimate births. They used philanthropy to eradicate social evils that were seen as utterly sinful. All the religious groups used financial endowments, which multiplied in the number and wealth as Germany grew richer. Each was devoted to a specific benefit to that religious community. Each had a board of trustees, these were laymen who donated their time to public service. Chancellor Otto von Bismarck an upper-class junker, used his state-sponsored philanthropy, in the form of his invention of the modern welfare state, to neutralize the political threat posed by the socialistic labor unions. The middle classes, however, made the most use of the new welfare state, in terms of heavy use of museums, gymnasiums, universities, scholarships, and hospitals. For example, State funding for universities and gymnasiums covered only a fraction of the cost, private philanthropy became the essential ingredient. 19th century Germany was even more oriented toward civic improvement than Britain or the United States, when measured in terms of voluntary private funding for public purposes. Indeed, such German institutions as the kindergarten, the research university, 
and the welfare state became models copied by the Anglo-Saxons. The heavy human and economic losses of the First World War, the financial crises of the 1920s, as well as the Nazi regime and other devastation by 1945, seriously undermined and weakened the opportunities for widespread philanthropy in Germany. The civil society so elaborately built up in the 19th century was practically dead by 1945. However, by the 1950s, as the economic miracle was restoring German prosperity, the old aristocracy was defunct, and middle-class philanthropy started to return to importance. The Commission for Relief in Belgium was an international organization that arranged for the supply of food to German-occupied Belgium and northern France during the First World War. It was led by Herbert Hoover. Between 1914 and 1919, the CRB operated entirely with voluntary efforts and was able to feed 11 million Belgians by raising the necessary money obtaining voluntary contributions of money and food, shipping the food to Belgium and controlling its there, for example, the CRB shipped £697,116,000 of flour to Belgium. Biographer George Nash finds that by the end of 1916, Hoover stood preeminent in the greatest humanitarian undertaking the world had ever seen. Biographer William Lukatenberg adds, he had raised and spent millions of dollars, with trifling overhead and not a penny lost to fraud. At its peak, his organization was feeding 9 million Belgians and French a day. When the war ended in late 1918, Hoover took control of the American Relief Administration, with the mission of food to Central and Eastern Europe. The ERA fed millions. U.S. government funding for the ERA expired in the summer of 1919, and Hoover transformed the ERA into a private organization, raising millions of dollars from private donors. Under the auspices of the ERA, the European Children's Fund fed millions of starving children. When attacked for distributing food to Russia, which was under Bolshevik control, Hoover snapped, 20 million people are starving. Whatever their politics, they shall be fed. The first corporation founded in the 13 colonies was Harvard College, designed primarily to them train young men for the clergy. A leading theorist was the Puritan theologian Cotton Mather, who in 1710 published a widely read essay, Bonifacius, or an essay to do good. Mather worried that the original idealism had eroded, so he advocated philanthropic benefaction as a way of life. Though his context was Christian, his idea was also characteristically American and explicitly classical, on the threshold of the Enlightenment. Benjamin Franklin was an activist and theorist of American philanthropy. He was much influenced by Daniel Defoe's An Essay Upon Projects and Cotton Mather's Bonifacius, An Essay Upon the Good. Franklin attempted to motivate his fellow Philadelphians into projects for the betterment of the city, examples included the Library Company of Philadelphia, the Fire Department, the police force, street lighting, and a hospital. A world-class physicist himself, he promoted scientific organizations including the Philadelphia Academy which became the University of Pennsylvania as well as the American Philosophical Society to enable scientific researchers from all 13 colonies to communicate. By the 1820s, Newly rich American businessmen were initiating philanthropic work, especially with respect to private colleges and hospitals. George Peabody is the acknowledged father of modern philanthropy. A financier based in Baltimore and London, in the 1860s he began to endow libraries and museums in the United States, 
and also funded housing for poor people in London. His activities became the model for Andrew Carnegie and many others. Andrew Carnegie was the most influential leader of philanthropy on a national scale. After selling his steel corporation in the 1890s he devoted himself to establishing philanthropic organizations, and making direct contributions to many educational cultural and research institutions. His final and largest project was the Carnegie Corporation of New York, founded in 1911 with a $25 million endowment, later enlarged to $135 million. In all, Carnegie gave away 90% of his fortune. Other prominent American philanthropists of the early 20th century included John D. Rockefeller, Julius Rosenwald, and Margaret Olivia Slocum Sage. Rockefeller retired from business in the 1890s, he and his son John D. Rockefeller Jr. made large-scale national philanthropy systematic especially with regard to the study and application of modern medicine, higher, education and scientific research. Of the $530 million the elder Rockefeller gave away, $450 million went to medicine. Their leading advisor Frederick Taylor Gates launched several very large philanthropic projects staffed by experts who sought to address problems systematically at the roots rather than let the recipients deal only with their immediate concerns. By the 1950s the Rockefeller Foundation was investing heavily in the Green Revolution, especially the work by Norman Borlaug that enabled India, Mexico, and many poor countries to dramatically upgrade their agricultural productivity. With the acquisition of most of the stock of the Ford Motor Company the late 1940s, the Ford Foundation became the largest American philanthropy, splitting its activities between the United States and the rest of the world. Outside the United States, it established a network of human rights organizations, promoted democracy, gave large numbers of fellowships for young leaders to study in the United States, and invested heavily in the Green Revolution, whereby poor nations dramatically increased their output of rice, wheat and other foods. Both Ford and Rockefeller were both heavily involved. Ford also gave heavily to build up research universities in Europe and worldwide. For example, in Italy in 1950 it sent a team to help the Italian Ministry of Education reform the nation's school system, based on the principles of meritocracy, democratization. It reached a compromise between the Christian Democrats and the Socialists to help promote uniform treatment and equal outcomes. The success in Italy became a model for Ford programs and many other nations. The Ford Foundation in the 1950s wanted to modernize the legal systems in India and Africa, by promoting the American model. The plan failed, because of India's unique legal history, traditions and profession as well as its economic and political conditions. Ford therefore turned to agricultural reform. The success rate in Africa was no better, and that program closed in 1977. John D. Rockefeller Ford Foundation